And now with refreshed souls, you will carry out your sacred responsibility, that of the election of the Supreme Body, the Universal House of Justice. And the diversity, I must tell you about the diversity. 175 National Spiritual Assemblies were represented. And on the day of the election, most of them, who had traditional dress, wore it. But the colour was just absolutely incredible. And seeing all these amazing different national costumes. Hello, my name's Heather Simpson. Welcome to Baha'i On Air. We have a very special guest for this program. Her name is Diane Scott, and she comes from Rarotonga. She's going to tell us about her recent visit to Haifa in Israel, where she took part in the election of the Supreme Administrative Body of the Baha'i Faith. Welcome, Diane. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Heather. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, Heather, my story, actually, I'm a world citizen, you know, even though I live in the Cook Islands. I was born in England, and as a teenager, I came to New Zealand to live. And I lived here for many years, 25 years, more than 25 years. Uh, must be almost 25 years ago, I found the Baha'i Faith. I became a Baha'i, and what I really wanted to do was serve. I really wanted to serve the faith. You know, in Baha'i, we don't have clergy, and it's up to the Baha'is to give their own service to the faith. It's not somebody else out there, and we all sit and follow. And I wanted to serve. So one of the first things I did when I became a Baha'i was pioneer. And pioneering basically is uh, Baha'is moving from one place to another to be of service to that Baha'i community. And so I pioneered to Rarotonga. And I've been there for almost 12 years now. How did you end up making this visit to Israel? There's a little bit of a story that leads up to that. The Baha'i administrative system has an electoral process, which is very, very different from any other electoral process that I know of. And each national community has a national body of Baha'is who are responsible for the administration on a national level. And the visit to Israel was the members of these national administrative bodies from all over the world who had to go to Israel or had the opportunity to go to Israel, not all of them could go, and their job was to take part in the election of the administrative body that you were talking about, the Universal House of Justice. And I am a member of the Cook Islands National Administrative Body, and so I had the opportunity to go. More than 1,000 delegates, members of the 175 National Spiritual Assemblies throughout the Baha'i world, gathered in the Holy Land for the 8th International Convention. I'm glad to see the diversity and also the number of women that has come to convention and the number of young people. I think this is, this is great. And to see the maturity of new National Assemblies. The whole human family is here for the first time. We have said that in the past, but truly Central Asia wasn't here before. And uh, there were places on earth that really weren't participating before. They're here. I came from the Baltic states. All uh, nine members of our National Assembly came here. This is the first time uh, I'm out of my country. And uh, I'm very fortunate to come straight to Haifa. I never met so many different people like this in my whole life. And today, seeing people, oh my God. I'm really overwhelmed with it. How long have you been a member of the National Spiritual Assembly of Cook Islands? I think I've been a member of that National Assembly for seven years. Did all nine members of the National Assembly no, of Cook Islands no. go? <laughs> one was not able to go. Unfortunately, one couldn't go. So eight of us went. In preparation for the convention, the participants visited the holy places associated with the central figures of the faith. 
spending hours in prayer and meditation at the sacred shrines. It's difficult to describe with words the feelings that I had. Overwhelming, uh, empowering might, I would say. I, I felt a lot of power, authority, I would say. Very, um, like the, the authority that the kings would have. In the shrine of Abdul Baha, I felt some some passionate spirit of you of the youth. I don't know. I felt some boiling spirit, maybe. There was something passionate about the spirit there, and uh, I, of course, envisioned Abdul Baha himself and the spirit of service and immense humility that he had. And of course, the whole shrine is permeated with this humility of of his personality. It's wonderful, such a wonderful feeling. I wish all the Baha'is were here today. There must have been a lot of people there in Haifa at the time of this event. How many National Spiritual Assemblies are there all around the world? Well, at the time of the election, there were 175. I understand that there's two more now. Were all of the National Spiritual Assemblies represented? As far as I know, all of the National Spiritual Assemblies had at least one member representing them. But there was one national community that was not able to send anybody because at the moment it's not allowed to have a National Spiritual Assembly because of the rules of the country, not the rules of the, of the Baha'i community. And Baha'is must obey the, the, the laws of the country. So the administration is not allowed to function. And that country is Iran or Persia. For us it's Persia because that's what it was called when the, faith, when the Baha'i faith was founded. But it's now known as Iran. And the Baha'is of Iran were not allowed to have an administrative um, organization functioning so they couldn't send a representative. But instead they sent this wonderful symbolic representation which was 95 beautiful red roses and they were displayed at the front of the stage. Absolutely beautiful display. And it was there for the whole time of, of, the, of the convention. So it was a reminder for every one of us of these Baha'is who were just unable to be there, but they were there in spirit with their roses. And all of us were constantly thinking of them, I think. That must have made for a very special event. What else was special about the activities in Haifa? One of the things that was very special was that there were four Baha'i Holy Days during that time. And this was absolutely unique. Two of them were birthdays. Um, the Baha'i Faith has twin founders. There's the Bab, who was the forerunner, a little bit like John the Baptist was to, to Christ, and Baha'u'llah, who was the founder of the Baha'i Faith. And in our calendar, in the Gregorian calendar, their birthdays are in different months. But in the calendar of the time when they were born, their birthdays were just one day apart. And it happened to fall that way this year when we were in Haifa. And this also happens during a very special festival of the Baha'is. And there were two holy days of that festival as well. It sounds like a really happy combination of circumstances. Were there any special commemorations to mark the holy days? The birthday of the Bab. You know, the Shrine of the Bab, I think most people who have seen any pictures about the Baha'i Faith must have seen this beautiful, beautiful shrine on Mount Carmel with a golden dome. The Baha'is call it the Queen of Carmel because of the golden crown on the top and the beautiful gardens all around it and wonderful gardens being developed going right down the mountain and up to the top of the mountain from it. The the birthday of the Bab was celebrated in the grounds of the shrine and there was a prayer service and after the prayer service then we all very, very reverently walked around the shrine. Very, very moving experience. Very, very precious to be there.
about the birthday celebrations for Baha'u'llah? How was that celebrated? Well, again, that was celebrated at his shrine. And his shrine is across the bay from Haifa. When you're on the mountain and you're standing by the shrine of the Baab, if you look right out across the bay, then you can see um, the prison city of Akka, where Baha'u'llah was a prisoner. And then just past there, there is the resting place of Baha'u'llah in a place called Baji. And we went to Baji for his birthday. And of course, going to Baji and the shrine of Baha'u'llah, this is the holiest place on earth for Baha'is. Very, very moving just so moving and they had the chairs set in the grounds around the shrine of Baha'u'llah and we're all looking at the shrine of facing towards the shrine of Baha'u'llah and the weather was perfect and the birds were singing in the trees it was just magical I feel our children can teach their peers they can teach their teachers they can teach all around them but I think maybe all together they can even teach the governments of the world. Interior will have him, but in behind a total reality will yet it and it's all to do. One thing I have learned from this conference, this gathering together is that there is a great deal, a great potential in Africa amongst the believers. We had level one book and uh, we, we completed around 3000 believers completed it, which means 3000 are now capable of coordinating another classes of this institute. And through the Ruhi Institute, we train the friends to go beyond the physical meaning of the word and connect their souls with the, with the power of the word of God. Oh, one of the things that really struck me so strongly was the amount of youth who were there. Not youth who were visiting, but youth who were serving. You know, I said at the beginning, one of the main things for Baha'is is how you can be of service to the Baha'i faith. That's what you want to do when you be a Baha'i. And we have these young people, and they want to serve. And a lot of them will go to the Holy Land, and they will serve the Baha'i faith at the Holy Land. And it just struck me so strongly how many youth were there, and how they looked after everybody. And their whole, everything about them was about service. They just wanted to to serve and make sure that everything was right for every single person. Didn't matter what you wanted. They were just there for service. They were wonderful. Mongolia. How did you get such a diverse group of people to take part in an election? Once again, it's just this incredible administrative system. And the diversity, I must tell you about the diversity. The, the people who were there were, as you said, from so many different countries, 175 National Spiritual Assemblies were represented. And on the day of the election, most of them, who had traditional dress, wore it. And, I mean, this is not a requirement, this is a choice. But the colour was just absolutely incredible. And seeing all these amazing different national costumes, there's, there's no anybody saying, vote for me in Baha'i. It just doesn't work that way. The Baha'is who were there have all been elected to serve on their national assemblies and then they are all invited to go to the Holy Land, if possible, to take part in this election. Those that couldn't go sent in an absentee ballot and the absentee ballots were put into the box at the correct time. Alaska. There was this amazing screen during the election. It had a map of the world and the part of the world that the next country to vote from was on it. And it had the name of the country that was voting along the top. And along the bottom was the next country to vote. And they organized it so that everybody who was about to vote were lined up. And we were lined down, down the front in alphabetical order and they would call out the name of each country and maybe say Cyprus for example was there and the name of each person and they would walk across the stage and put their ballot in the box and walk off the other side and if a person wasn't able to be there their absentee vote was put in the box in, its, in their place. I think there were 1500, 1500 
ballots were cast and the time that it took was just amazing just like clockwork absolutely and just so colorful and absolutely so moving incredibly moving was there a high participation rate in the election i think there were 1575 people were eligible to vote and 30 of them didn't what provision was made for the votes to be counted we're, we're voting for nine people so we write down the name of the nine people who we want to vote for put it inside an envelope and it's sealed the envelope goes inside that box and then we all watch everybody put the envelope in the box. Nothing else goes in the box. To start with, they even tip the box upside down to show us that it was empty. Then after all the envelopes had been put in, they sealed the top of it so nothing else could be put in. And then they took it away with the tellers and the tellers stayed with it. And we all went off and did something really nice after that. We actually went to another Holy Day celebration and the tellers counted the votes and they counted and counted and counted until way into the night so that they they got a result and the next day the result was announced the head teller came to the podium announced how many possible votes there were how many were cast and then read out the names of the nine people who had been elected and as she read out the names each one of them came onto the stage the applause for these people was just thunderous. It was absolutely thunderous. And it just went on and on and on. And everybody was stood up. And I thought, you know, usually when there's clapping, it starts to fade. And it didn't. It was just kept on at full pace, you know, this incredibly thunderous clapping. And I thought, you know, we were obviously so thrilled with the results um, that nobody was going to stop clapping. And then the person whose name had been read out first, he was standing closest to the, the podium. And he went to the podium and just with a slight movement of his hand, hardly anything else, and everybody stopped clapping and sat down. It was just amazing. Your warm applause touches our hearts. We are overwhelmed a feeling of inadequacy because of our personal shortcomings, our personal deficiencies, as we face the challenges ahead. Yet, <clears throat> we are confident that if we arise and if we place our trust in the Lord, an all-seeing, a prayer hearing, a prayer answering Lord, he will certainly come to our aid as he has come in the past. And he will use us, unworthy instruments as we are. And it was the most humble speech it's not the kind of victory speech that you would hear in any other election. It was so humble, it was so beautiful, and very, very moving. Brings tears to my eyes when I think about it. Um, but these, these nine people now will be the members of the Universal House of Justice in charge of the international affairs of the Baha'i community for the next five years. Tell us about why Baha'i elections are different from other elections around the world. Well, it's absolutely, totally different. I can't even think of a similarity, just off the top of my head. There are no parties. We don't have an opposition. These people will govern the affairs with such purity of heart that what they want is the best. For everybody, there's no self-interest involved in it. It's the best for the Baha'i community and the best for the non-Baha'i community as well, the best for the world. The Baha'i community actually contributes in tremendous ways to world affairs. Um, the Baha'i international community has offices in Geneva and New York and works with the United Nations. It, it's not um, an exclusive um, organization at all. It's very, very outward looking and it does its best to contribute to the welfare of the world. And these people who've been elected, 
That's their only desire. Diane, there must be some form of nomination to decide on the candidates. How do you know who to vote for? So how, how do people from Africa, for instance, or very far away places such as the Cook Islands, know who to vote for? Well, you know, it's a challenge. Um, but there is no nominations, nothing like that at all. And you're free to vote for whoever you choose. When you know that you have been elected to serve on the National Assembly that is going to vote for the next international body, the next Universal House of Justice, you make it your business to find out who are the people who you feel would be worthy of serving on the Universal House of Justice. And you don't discuss it with other people. You don't say, oh, this one or that one or the other one. It's up to you as an individual. And, and you do it. It's a sacred responsibility. And, and you do. So, Diane, tell us what it felt like to be there in Haifa taking part in this event. Well, you know, it was so overwhelming to be there. Um, to feel that, that, why me? Why me? You know, because there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of Baha'is in the world. Some of the time I had to pinch myself that I was really there. To be taking part in voting for this, for this international body of the Baha'i Faith is such an overwhelming responsibility. It's a huge responsibility um, and a huge privilege. And I, I don't know that I can explain how I felt about that. You mentioned the gardens on uh, the slopes of Mount Carmel. Tell us what they were like. The gardens are absolutely incredible, just so beautiful. Some of them are finished, some of them are not quite finished. And one where I, I went to, and there's fountains, there's the trees, there's the birds, the perfume of the flowers, I hear the water of the fountain. And around the, the pathways, there's these little red pebbles. And when somebody walks on the pebbles, they tinkle. So you hear this light tinkling of the, of the sound of people walking on the pebbles. And you hear this lovely sound of the water and the birds singing. And it's like you're in paradise. And you can just enjoy with every one of your senses the perfume of the flowers, what you can hear. And you can feel this wonderful energy. And there's a big city going on down there in the port of Haifa, and it's like it's in another world. How many terraces were there on the mountain? Well, there's 19 total. You know, those ones down from the shrine below, there's nine of those. And then the shrine of the Barb sits on one, and then there's nine more up above. You'd have to go there during the daytime because you wouldn't be able to see it at night. No, you wouldn't, because at night time it is lit up. It is absolutely beautiful at night time. It's, it's so moving at night time. The shrine is lit up and the terraces now have lights on them. Terrace 19, the one right at the top, has just recently been opened. And that's a magnificent terrace. But you know, when you're up there looking down, it is so steep. It's incredibly steep. Absolutely amazing that they could landscape it. It must have been very beautiful to be Absolutely there. beautiful. And the landscaping is exquisite. You know, it's very, very formal close to the steps. And then as it moves away from the steps, it gets more informal and the rocks and the rock plant. Diane, tell us how you became a Baha'i. Oh, goodness. Well, I think, you know, I was brought up Christian. In my early years, I was brought up Christian. Um, my mother wanted us all to have a, a Christian background. My father wasn't so interested in, in any religion. But I found it very difficult because we, we moved around a lot when we were children and we would go to this church and then we would move to another house. My father was a policeman and he kept getting relocated. So we would go to another house and we'd go to a different church and that church would teach something different from this church. And it really confused me as a child because as far as I knew there was only one Bible and it really confused me why they had these different ideas. And eventually in my early teens I decided I really didn't need this. And I left Christianity and even God. I really thought, well, I, I kind of didn't see the difference between God and Christianity. I thought he was it. And I just left it all out of my life and I went on without it. And I didn't make a very good job of it, by the way. <laughs> but I heard about Baha'i 
when my mother became a Baha'i. And this must have been 1976. And I, I knew that my mother uh, wouldn't do anything stupid. So I, I thought, well, there must be something in it. But I actually didn't really want to check it out for myself at that time. But a couple of years later, I checked it out. And as soon as I checked it out, I was kicking myself that I didn't check it out as soon as I heard about it because it was exactly what I believed. Um, or if I hadn't already believed it, I thought, well, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> because it all made so much sense to me. And it, I just became a Baha'i within a very short time of actually having started to check it out. It's so logical, it's so common sense and so clear. And for me, it gave me the guidelines for my life. Like I said, I didn't make a great job of it because I think I grew up in that time where uh, it was freedom, it was the flowers of San Francisco and, you know, do what you like and find your happiness as you, as you want to. And when you find your happiness as you want to, you tend to fall off the path sometimes. And I fell off the path. And finding Baha'i actually gave me the guidelines to stay on the path. What sort of guidelines do you think you needed? Well, it's a way of life, really. Baha'i faith is a way of life. And it's not something that you do one day a week and the rest of the week you please yourself. It's actually a, a blueprint for how to live your life to achieve what the purpose of life is. Because obviously life has a purpose, it's not for nothing. And, and Baha'i tells you what the purpose is and how you achieve it. And that was great for me. <laughs> solved all my problems. Well, in one way it solved all my problems and then it gave me the challenge of, of trying to do it. Yeah. Thank you, Diane, for spending this time with us on Baha'i On Air. It's been really interesting. Oh, that's my pleasure. And thank you all for spending time with Baha'i On Air. I'm Heather Simpson. Join us again next time. Let us pour our love to our children.